All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the Ripple Effect. Tonight we have another great guest. It's fun to have him on board. It's somebody that uh, memories go way back with and somebody that uh, we walked many a miles on our spiritual path together in many a places. And uh, before I kick it off and introduce him, I'm gonna share my screen to show a few photographs. You can see that okay? Oh. <laughs> so here's the link to Tom Sawyer, right? There's Tom, you know, Tom Sawyer on the far right, Tom Williams. Actually, the gentleman we just talked about here, who we'll have on the show here coming up, Jeff Tebow. Burke Stedman. Is Burke still around? No, no, he passed on. Sadly. Did he really? Yep. Oh, man. Oh, what a great guy. All right, good deal. But anyway, so that's, it's, it's great that to see. Been on, the, on the other end there. Uh, there's a, actually, they're, a, they're considerate some kind of an extraterrestrial, I'm not <laughs> sure. He tends to show up in pictures <laughs> at the worst moment, you know, but usually it's only half of him. Because the other <laughs> half, the other half of him has always been gone. <laughs> he's, just, he's trying to photobomb, he's just not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I said. Over here. No, I'm over here. Over here. No, no, no. Tom Sawyer's in the picture. He's over there. He's over there. <laughs> you notice how Tom is pushing everybody so that you're half out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And and if you notice, what I recall behind it, this, this was a dark fixture. So I wonder what these lights are above Tom. Uh, it looks like an overhead... <laughs> UFO, I think. Uh, yeah, Tom's, no, halo, Tom's halo is spotty and square. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Richard, playing the role. I love it. This is good. I, I, this is great. All right, good. And picture number two is is here. We were. Where oh, were we, Tom? Uh, that, that's just below the pyramids and the Sphinx. <laughs> yes. It is, and this is a great way to introduce such a fabulous part of Tom is he's is, is a natural musician. He just, uh, wherever we go, would break it out and his, his uh, cohort turns out to be his neighbor, Jeff, you know, also on flute, mm -hmm. you know, here. So, and there's me who's uh, the only instrument that I could play <laughs> that I was good at. Right, it was, it was whatever that was, the feather. carried it from your birth and you still had it. All right. <laughs> yes, oh, that's great too. And then uh, final picture sort of introduced Tom, Tom and his wife, Aza, who this is actually, do you, do you recall where this was, Tom? Uh, I would say that's on the, the lake there at Geneseo, right? Yes, it is. Yep, I, it's, it it's, like I, it, yeah. I lived right there. You know, but what, whatever the little lake was called. Yes, Canisius <laughs> Lake. Canisius yeah. Lake. Yeah. And you know, what I really loved about this is, first of all, I mean, this is a great part of your story, a tough part of your story, too, is a story of it. Uh, but also just here's the picture and the hot air balloon just right in between you. Couldn't have been yeah. more perfect. And yeah. I've never seen this picture. It's neat. Uh, and there's the uh, form Sanctuary of the Beloved insignia. Yes. And the buff silver look. <laughs> yes. And every that's, <laughs> that's what it meant. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I'd, I'd love to uh, introduce uh, Tom and, and uh, welcome him here. And uh, Tom, I'd love to hear just a little bit about yourself. And really what I'd like to do is, is you know, is we, we what we all share in common is this thing called spiritual path and thing. What, what, how would you define spirituality for you and the spiritual path? Is there, was there an origin to it? And then as we'll get in, we'll sort of talk about the link up to Tom, the impact that he had and whatever else is in, on our minds. So, Well, I think my spiritual path began uh, when I was about 17 years old. I had rheumatic fever. And in those days, what they required was that you... Can you pull, can you pull the microphone? The microphone's down here. Can you pull it up a little bit? Ah. Yeah. Oh, good. That's <laughs> it. There it is. Oh, 
Oh, by, by the way, uh, yeah, you've got, there's a slight darkness on one of those right here. We might, <laughs> might get you there for a little we'll root canal. Yeah. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> now, got it. you hear me? Okay. What? I, I don't know. I'll take it off. Um, okay, so when I was 17, I had rheumatic fever. And the requirement in those days was you were basically bedridden and that you take penicillin for like the rest of your life. And so for months and months and months, uh, I was in the bed. And the only thing that I really had to entertain myself was my guitar. And I've always played guitar or loved guitar. And so I put the guitar on my chest, basically, and would, would strum the guitar and play the guitar like that. And so after many, many um, months and uh, missing school and so forth, uh, and at one point I was, was trying to relax um, with this being in the bed. And I thought I would just stop breathing for a while, not long time, but just long enough to um, relax. And so I started breathing more slowly and more slowly and more slowly. And just to the point of where I would say, well, I'm just going to stop breathing for a little bit and see what that's like. And so I developed this whole quietness. And then the guitar, I, I later realized that that was a part of my healing because it was right on my chest, right on my heart. I fortunately didn't have any major heart damage as some people do with rheumatic fever. I have a, a slight heart murmur still. Um, but during that time, and also it's kind of like the virus now, you have to detach yourself from your routine. Whatever I was doing before that, I wasn't doing. I wasn't doing what all the other teenagers did and I wasn't going to school and I wasn't you know, active. I couldn't really do a whole lot. So that slowing down made me really appreciate what I could do. And playing guitar was the one thing I could do. Uh, so I had really developed guitar, the guitar playing and the love of the guitar even more um, during that time, because I played guitar before that, but I, I never really appreciated the value that the simplicity of that instrument uh, and, and just the connection with the strings and everything vibrating right on me. So from that time when my life changed. And uh, so I saw things a little differently than my other peers. Uh, I was more attentive to nature and to, um, you know, just being outdoors, just t doing what I could do, which is not much. Um, so I think that was the beginning of it for me. I didn't really just wake up and all of a sudden have all sorts of dreams and all, you know, a bunch of activities and angels and space people and all that stuff. But I think that was the start for me, was, was that debilitation, you know, that, that being taken from my daily life. And uh, so it, it just continued then and gradually over time, uh, I had uh, developed, uh, I guess, an awareness of things. And I was at the North Carolina School of the Arts. So this love of music just propelled me into wanting to do more with it. And so I majored in music. And during that time, um, I had all kinds of experiences with music and performing and traveling and touring and all of that. Um, I eventually, uh, at some point, left the School of the Arts. Uh, and what happened was uh, I had gone with a friend to Myrtle Beach. And while we were there, we were walking down the beach and there was, um, I don't know if you know Myrtle Beach at all, but there's a, a spiritual center there called the Mayor Baba Center. And um, somebody had said that there's this place over there that's spiritual and whatnot. And I was already beginning to be interested in spirituality to some extent. So I said, let's go in and visit. So we, unbeknownst to us, there is a process that you're supposed to go through to go to visit the center. Well, I've always considered myself a backdoor spiritual spiritual speaker. So we went off the beach, which was not the way you're supposed to go. 
and wandered in off the beach and found this building. And inside the building, there were pictures of Mayor Baba. And this was a gathering place that he had spent uh, when his devotees were there. And of course, I didn't really know much about it. Went in and sat down and thought, well, we'll, you know, we'll sit here for a while. And so I was sit sitting there and looking at the picture and, and in, in the picture, there was a picture of Mayor Baba holding a, a lamb. And um, it, it was just a very simple picture of him embracing this lamb in his arms. And he looked nice. And I thought, is this, you know, he's very nice and he loves animals. So that's a good start. So I think I'll just uh, sit here and meditate for a while. And while I was doing that, I felt like I, and, and you know, it wasn't a spectacular and a woo. I felt like I had lifted off the ground and that I was up in the room um, just floating. And I didn't fall. And so, which is a good thing. And then when that was over, I thought, well, gosh, you know, that really, that was uplifting, <laughs> you know, that felt good. Let's go a little further. <laughs> so we went further into the complex and looked around and we were walking around looking at the people in the buildings and I asked, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately, I made the mistake of asking a question. As, and so the question that I asked made it clear that I had not gone through the front gate, had not done the proper protocol, and that I, sh I should have known the answer, you know, uh, had I gone through that. And so it became clear that I hadn't. And so I, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know even that I was supposed to do that. And so we, we took the other, the, the correct route eventually went around the outside and came through and took the tour. And, and so that was that. And so that was my introduction to Mayor Baba. And, you know, and that it, by that time he had already passed and so forth. But, um, and because I was in transition, I decided, well, you know, this is a really neat place. I think I'll move to Myrtle Beach and stay for a few years. So I moved to Myrtle Beach, lived in an Airstream trailer um, and that was a very, very powerful time for me. I had a lot of spiritual openings, a lot of spiritual experiences. And, to, and uh, one of those was I came up to the mound uh, behind where I currently live. It's a mound called Mother Mound. And it was my birthday. And so this was towards the end of my time in Myrtle Beach. And it was my birthday. And it was May 23rd and 19, um, whatever it was, I think it was, oh gosh. 1863? Seven, seven, when, when seven, did seven, when did 78. 78, it was 1978, May 23rd, 1978. Wow, really? And I was on the mound. And at that point, I have, was already having all these experiences by virtue of Mayor Baba, you know, kind of attuning to that. Um, and I, while I was up on the mound, I had this idea that I was going to exercise my power through my voice, because that's something that I had not done much of. I played guitar, I did all these, you know, percussion. I actually majored in percussion, which is banging on things, right? But I never really valued my voice all that much. In fact, I, I felt shy about that. I was a very shy person, actually, in a lot of ways, and, and part of me still is. So I thought I'm going to I'm going to let my voice really resound. And so I went huh like this really loud, and a spark of light went off. It's like in the sky, it was at night here. And so the spark of light went off and boom, like that. And I thought, oh, whoa, I better watch that. <laughs> I might want to control that a little better. Um, so, you know, I thought that was interesting. And of course, it wasn't until years later uh, when I was ordained in 1987 and met Tom Sawyer that I realized that that was the day that he went, had his near death experience uh, on my birthday. And, but there was something about the experience of having done that vocalization of really come out of myself to express myself more and not just through playing guitar or through music, you know, sort of a silent me um, that 
that seemed to make sense to me. There was a connection. And so that, that um, the period of evolution where I had withdrawn and, and I was actually, uh, I had retired during the years I was at Myrtle Beach from the job that I had, state job. So I took a few years off. And so right after that, I moved to Boston. And there was a spiritual community there, a Sufi um, community. And there was a teacher there, uh, Pir Vilayat Anayat Khan, who was a Sufi master. Uh, and I visited the Sufi community um, through a theater workshop, a theater group that came to Myrtle Beach or came to South Carolina and visited. And so while I was at that um, visiting this group of uh, actors at this retreat that they had, I met uh, Pir Vilayat and Ayat Khan and um, played music with him. I didn't really talk with him all that much, but there was a thing called the, um, I think a universal celebration or something like that, that was being done while I was there. So I thought, well, join us and play with this, this thing. And so this was, um, you know, my introduction to the Sufi community in, in Boston. And at that point, I wasn't much of a joiner. In fact, at Myrtle Beach, everybody called themselves Baba lovers. And I was reluctant to do that. I, I, I just wasn't the kind of person that liked to join, you know, groups or societies or organizations. And I wasn't, my dad was a Baptist minister. And so for years, I said that something like I'm a, um, what was it? Something reformed Baptist or some, something like that, a recovering Baptist or, you know, something along those lines. Because I, I never was fully into that organized religion part. So I was a non-joiner for a long time. And so when I moved, moved to Boston, actually, after that, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not a Sufi, I'm, I'm not a Baba lover, and, but I had a dream uh, one night when I was actually staying in, in when I first got there. And Pier, in the dream, Pir Vilayat, uh, whose father was Hazarat Anayat Khan, who was kind of the head of the Sufi order, some of people might know who he is, um, came, there was a meeting and Hazarat Anayat Khan, who has now passed and by that time had already passed, was sitting in the, in the dream, sitting in the other end of this room. This was right next to where I was sleeping in a rocking chair. And he was just sitting there rocking back and forth like that. And so Pierre Vali said, I want you to meet my father. So that's okay, well, I'll go in to meet his father. And I went up to the, to the Sufi leader, you know, and bowed down like you're supposed to. And he said, tell those Sufis not to take themselves so seriously in the dream. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm going to tell these people that, you know, so it, uh, that was the dream. And, and, you know, and he gave me a hug and I went back out and, went to get, you know, to my bed. And, and so later, and when they were having a gathering in that room, and I had introduced myself to, to the group as a guest and so forth, I thought, well, should I say this? You know, am I supposed to? And so I did. And I, I, I told them of my experience. And I said, you know, he told me to tell you not to take yourself so serious. And they all cracked up, you know. And so it was, it was good. So I learned at that point that it's okay to express myself on, on my intuitions, on the things that I'm guided to do, on the dreams, on the experiences. So that was okay. And so that gave me more confidence uh, to keep doing that if, if if it's appropriate. And then uh, from Boston, I, I moved back to Virginia. I, well, actually, this, this is where Isa comes into the story. I met Isa, uh, who is in the picture there with the balloon, in Boston. And so that was, you know, what I always thought, well, that's why I went to Boston, you know, really, it was to meet Isa. And she was working in a restaurant, and it's a health food restaurant. And so I uh, I had walked up to the counter and she said, may I help you? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you know? I mean, I didn't say anything. Uh, so, uh, but, she, you know, she just glowed. And so I thought, well, I might start eating here. You know, this is, this is a nice little place here in Jamaica Plain where I was living. 
And uh, so we, I, I frequented there, we met, we talked. And then at that point I thought, well, I'm gonna start doing some classes. I'm sorry to be talking so much, but that's okay. Uh, you wanted my no, story, it's a long story. story, I'm telling you. Um, so I went to, to the restaurant quite a bit and we got to know each other and hung out and everything. And I was started, so I'm gonna start, somebody said, why don't you, because I was ex talking about some of my psychic experiences that I had developed while I was at Myrtle Beach and while I was at the Sufi Center and all these different things, things started opening up. And I was sharing about some of those experiences that I had. And somebody said, well, why don't you go to a psychic fair? And I said, a what? Oh, I had never heard of a psychic fair. You guys are from the Northeast. You probably heard them, you know, most of your life. Um, and I said, yeah, it's a psychic fair. And you can go and you sit and you do these readings for people for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, right? So I thought, oh my God, can I do that? You know, and I said, I don't know, why not? You know, so I went to the psychic fair and I was, <laughs> so I, you know, the person would sit down in front of you, you know, and you'd say, <clears throat> yes, okay, well, and you have a question. And I would go and close my eyes and I would start getting these things and I would, and I didn't know if it was right or not. You know, I, I mean, you, you don't know, you just have to get that you get the impression and you share what you see. And, and, and I'm not taking responsibility for it. I'm just telling you, here's what I see. And it seemed to make sense to people and it seemed to work. And then uh, towards the end of one of these, uh, somebody came over and, and said, do you do healing? I said, I, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and so I can try. And so I, I, th th she said, well, here, my, this friend of mine has, has gonna have an operation. I think it was the next day or something and it was her wrist. And so she, she said, well, can you heal my arm? I said, oh, I, I don't know if I can do anything, but I'll be happy to channel, you know, whatever energy there is from God and from, from the spirit. And if it helps, that's fine. So, so I thought, what am I gonna do? So well, I'll just love her. I'll love her arm the way it is and just hold it. And so that's what I did. And so for like maybe 10 seconds or so, was holding her arm and all of a sudden she started saying, ooh, ah, oh, you know, all these things. And she started moving her arm around and it's like, it's healed, you know, and I thought, oh my God, you know what? <laughs> I just opened myself up to it. I had had a ganglia, I don't know what a ganglia is, on the wrist. Yeah. I had one of those then and had had it for years. And they always put a, hit it with a Bible and it'll go away. And so I, I didn't try that, but after I got through with this healing, that ganglia was gone. It just disappeared, never came back. Wow. And so I thought, wow, you know, this stuff really works. And not only does it heal the person that you're trying to heal, but it heals the healer. It's just a flow of energy that, that moves through and, and whoever's in the way, <laughs> get some of it, you know? And so I, I really learned about, again, about communication. Um, when you get an intuition, yes, I know. My dog communicates too. Uh, about allowing that to flow and trusting that that can flow. And uh, so I was then started doing classes. And so it gets back to Isa. And so Isa took one of my classes and it was a full moon one night and we were having this class and I was talking about development and all the psychic development and everything. And so she was, was sitting there and, and the class went okay. And after the class, she came up and I said, well, do you have a question? But you know, what, what do you think? And she said, yes. Would you spend the rest of the night with me? <laughs> so, well, that wasn't exactly what I was <laughs> hinting at. Um, so we spent the rest of the night talking and walking and, you know, just getting to know each other. And so that was the beginning of our relationship. And uh, she's very, she's German or was yeah. German and very direct. And so I, I learned from, again, from her about the being direct, you know, it's like, I'm getting it back now, you know, okay. Um, because I was very shy. I, I, I had a very hard time 
approaching somebody about a relationship. It just wasn't in my my makeup to to be, you know, hey baby, you know, I wasn't like that. So it's probably the way it had to be. So anyway, we got together and we we ended up down here in, in the mountains uh, in 1980. Uh, then we decided to, to get married on the mound here, on the mother mound that I was telling you about behind the house. Mm -hmm. uh, we got married up there and my dad was the minister uh, for that. And uh, so a few years went by and I went to a conference that Richard had gone to. And I don't know if you went to those conferences in Greensboro, uh, Mike, but I know Richard, you did, right? To the yep. Southern Conference there. Um, Southeastern. Southeast. Yep. And that's where I met Dan Chesbro and various, you know, various other people. Uh, and during that, uh, he was talking about this priesthood, and that was in 1987, I think it was, um, when that occurred. And that he was, and there were only like maybe at that time six or seven people in the priesthood. Uh, because when I was ordained, I, he said, well, there's this ordination, if you'd like to do it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so at the end of that conference, I was teaching psychic development or doing readings or something. And so somebody, he said that, and somebody said, well, you, would you like to do that? I said, yeah, I would. And so I w was playing music, actually, um, that weekend. I had to go back up to, to play music, and I came back in my tuxedo. And from the, from the gig I was playing, and there were people camped out in this house, you know, because this is a, that's where it was going to be in somebody's home, and there was a, there were a bunch of people sleeping on the floor. So I come in with my tuxedo, and um, found me a spot, and the next day I was ordained. And so uh, when I was ordained, I was the seventeenth person that had been ordained in priesthood. Uh, because was, I think there were seven of us, so that meant there were 10 people in the priesthood. And so um, and I got my ordination and I went back and, and he said, well, if you, if you, and he, at that point he didn't even have ordination certificates. And so somebody's heard I've been ordained and I said, would you like to do our wedding? I said, well, uh, I suppose, uh, but I will need, will need a certificate. So I went to the courthouse in Floyd to find out what I needed. And they said, okay, you've, uh, you know, you'll need a certificate from the priesthood. So I called Dan and he didn't have any. So I said, well, make one up. <laughs> so, he, and I have it. He, he hand wrote <laughs> and drew in some stuff and you know it was a handwritten it, and so I took it over to the courthouse they sent it to me and they said they looked at it <laughs> your grandmother could have drawn this <laughs> are you sure this is real and so I you know I called Dan back and I said look Dan um, they didn't quite believe that this was real so you think you could do another one so he had his secretary at that point, and I, I can't remember her name, um, had her make one up and on the computer, you know, they did the yep. official and everything. Um, so they sent me that one. And, yep, this looks good. This looks right. And so that was actually the first certificate. I got the first certificate in the priesthood and did probably the first wedding uh, in the priesthood as a result of that. So... <laughs> There was a little learning curve there, you know, in the beginning years for what, what really needed to happen to make it a little more official. Because it was very ad hoc in those days, you know, there's not a lot of protocol. So, uh, so I was ordained. And then as a result of that, there were all these trips that you guys come yeah. in. And of course, Tom Sawyer. So enter Tom Sawyer into the priesthood and um, Many, many experiences, of course, with Tom uh, helping me to uh, appreciate the simplicity aspect that I was talking about before, because I, I wasn't much, this all was new to me, but happening. And so his, the, and I think you talked about this, Richard, when you, you talked about Tom previously, <clears throat> about how he was just such a real person and down yeah. 
person. Um, and exactly. that really spoke to me and just the nature of the priesthood. And one of the things that Tom had always talked about was that one of the reasons he was had come back was for the priesthood and to help uh, to guide the priesthood and to be an advisor and to be a part of it and to do the work that he did. And, and the priesthood kind of became an arm of his work. It was, it was like we helped him together um, to, for the things like the nuclear detonation potential that was about to happen and the prayers and the prayer group that we've all been a part of. Um, so that, that's how I met Tom Sawyer. In fact, the first time I met Tom Sawyer, I have to tell you this, was, was in Virginia. I think it was Charlottesville. He was at a conference with Sidney Farr, who was the author of the book that they shared. And this was the, the first time I saw Tom Sawyer and he was doing his talk. And so I sat down, had the talk, started the talk, and he talked and he talked and he talked, like kind of like what I'm doing now. He talked and talked and talked. And I thought You're not gonna go all night though. No, I'm not. He, he and he did. In fact, he went on for I think yeah. it was almost three days. Non stop. Ah, he didn't even get up to go to the bathroom. He didn't get up yeah. to go eat. People were starting to think, well, when is this, you know, when is this, uh, when is this? <laughs> <laughs> so they were afraid to leave because he was still talking, you know, so um, I've got to go to the bathroom myself. And so people would go to the bathroom or they would go, I said, I said better go have dinner, you know. And so people would come and go and it was kind of like, wow, you know, how does he do that? And of course, it took him a long time because he would cry and then he would talk and, and have, you know, it was that process. So that was the beginning of my experiences with the all-nighters with Tom Sawyer. So after that, we learned, well, bring your blanket, bring your pillow, and don't mind if you go to sleep because you're going to wake up when you need to hear the thing that you need to hear. And that would happen over and over again. Richard, am I right? Yes, absolutely. You know, you could be doing, you could be looking it out. You could just maybe go out, go to the bathroom, come back in. And when you came back in, you would hear what you needed to hear or yep. whenever. So, because he was talking to so many different people, I guess he needed that much time, you know, and just like, well, okay, you guys work it out here. You come in when you need to hear what you need to hear and I'll figure that out. <laughs> um, so that was, that was how that started. And then Isa um, graciously, allowed me to go on these trips. Uh, she came to the conferences uh, quite a few times, um, but she always had a kind of a, a, a she thought Tom, eh, she wasn't as much into that. Mm -hmm. So, but at some point she did get ordained. And so, and in fact, my daughter who was six years old at the time Dan came down for a for a, a event these in search of programs that you've been involved in, Richard. And I guess maybe Mike, you have. I can't recall. No, I've not. Okay, uh, we had a, an event here at, that Dan came down to, and so he was asking, "Who wants to be?" You know, after he gave his talk, would you like to be ordained? He can't ask people, but they have to ask. So my six-year-old daughter. <laughs> Her mother had been ordained, her father had been ordained. So she said, may I be ordained? And so we all kind of looked around, well, uh, okay. Um, you know, so she was ordained at six years old. And I guess she was the youngest at that, certainly at that time. And maybe other than one other person who was almost her age, um, the only other six year old that I know of that's been ordained. And now she lives on the property and we're starting wedding business together. Oh. Yeah, on the mound and, and on the, the area around here that we live in and that Tom Sawyer had come to actually. Uh, he, he came here uh, at least on one occasion. We had a gathering kind of after those conferences ended and we mm -hmm. had a, a kind of, yep. you know, reclamation, you know, where are we? What are we, what are we doing? And, and after right. the conferences ended, and so he was here and we did a whole bunch of ceremonies uh, on the mound. We did a made a priesthood symbol and moved it around and did some all kinds of stuff. Um, and so ceremonies became a big part of my life kind of around a lot of that uh, because I, I started to see that 
<clears throat> it's not just enough to talk about stuff. You need to do something with what you know. And one way I thought of doing stuff and was by ceremonies because they sort of, and it's like a, a, a physical way of enacting what you're talking about. And so uh, a lot of those ceremonies evolved out of that. Um, and Isa got ordained. Uh, she unfortunately passed away um, in 1999 um, on Christmas. It was December 18th, just before Christmas. And Mike, you asked about how you deal with that um, when uh, you have a loss of that magnitude. And while I was doing Santa Claus, and I, by the way, had started doing Santa Claus, Richard, um, after the trip to Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that, maybe that first one, I don't remember exactly. 91? Uh, yeah. So after I came back, I started, somebody said, why don't you play Santa Claus? You've got a long, a, a white beard and everything, you know, kind of like you. I said, I don't know. You know, I never thought about being Santa Claus. So I went to the mall and somebody said, well, yeah, we'd love to have you be Santa Claus. So I did that for a year. I said, the mall is not for me. Uh, if I'm going to do Santa Claus, it needs to be something more uh, involved with the kids and something more natural for me. So I started a whole uh, idea of being St. Nicholas and doing stories and music. And I started writing stories and books and, uh, you know, I devolved. So 25 years later, I'm still Santa Claus. And um, so that evolved. But after that trip, um, in, I came back and this phase started to develop then. And during the trip, I don't know if it was that one, but one of the years later, Mike, when you were in it, and you and I was that Pether picture where we were standing, uh, I guess, next to Tom, because I was the yellow. Um, we had these ribbons. And you have a ribbon too? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's why you were in that, that, that line there. You were probably on the other side and I was on one side and the other side, standing next to Tom, holding these candles as a part of the ceremony. Yes, yes. And where the candle melted in his hand. <laughs> yes, I told that story. Yes, yes. And, and <laughs> we both looked at that, and, and whoever was standing nearby, because they were just do that could really see what happened. And it was like, man, it's hot in here, but not that hot. <laughs> you know. So, and Kara was actually in that ceremony, my daughter, who was ordained, and um, because they had a had a thing in the ceremony. To, and they brought, there were three young people there and they were kind of a part of that ceremony uh, to open up awareness, uh, to bring in light, to bring in the blue light as, as we began to realize at some point. Um, so anyway, that's, I could go on and on, but I don't want to do a Tom Sawyer here. Oh, but you know, this is fantastic. Tom, I mean, so much of this, for all of the time that we spent together, I never knew. And I, I'm so glad you talked and shared. It's fascinating to, to know, you know, your story, to, to know what or how you really came to develop this. And so for somebody new, you know, on this journey or contemplating it, you know, how, how would you say you define spirituality today? I mean, we're used to religious connotations to it and everything. How do you define it? Well, more and more, it's becoming clear to me from other teachers and from uh, what's happening now in our world that I'm, I'm starting to gather a more simplistic viewpoint of all of this. I mean, I still do ceremonies and value ceremonies, but more and more, it's about silence and about listening and Tom tried many many times to tell us this that if you could just for a moment stop thinking yeah. you know, and which is very difficult to do and so now I'm, I'm looking at things like um, uh, Edgar Tolle and people like that who mm -hmm. are talking a lot about the, the simplicity of listening and of silence and that the, the only moment is really now and that now is just a, is, is, you know, our history is, was still now. Our future is still now. You know, everything is now. 
And that's a hard one to understand for a lot of people. But learning to, to again, go back to my, guitar, my rheumatic fever days of slowing down and listening and being silent and being still that uh, I, what I would tell people now, and I, and I do have other people around me that, that I, I try to help from time to time. Uh, my work now involves taking care of people with disabilities and I do that full time, 24 seven. Um, so that has been my lesson for, for this part of the last 15, 10, 15 years, it's been learning to be still and quiet and spiritual in the midst of all kinds of things. <laughs> you know, sometimes chaos, sometimes anger, sometimes um, revelations. I've worked a lot with Special Olympics over the years. So I've immersed myself in service in, in, as a part of my a spiritual path as, as of late. Not so many of, I haven't done spiritual journeys and trips and um, all of these conferences and readings and all of that. I haven't done any of that lately. Uh, my journey has been about mostly being, you know, <laughs> learning how to serve in the midst of chaos, you know, and it's not always chaos, other stuff. But, I remember being down there for uh, that reclamation thing and you had a couple of men you were taken mm -hmm. care of at yeah. that time. Right. And I saw the difficulty require the difficulty of taking care of them. Yeah. And the immense personal understanding of yourself yeah. you, you needed to achieve in order to handle them appropriately yes. rather than just get upset at right. the behaviors they may have. I was so impressed with the depth of personal the personal depth you had to go to yeah. to understand yourself, to be able to hate, to deal with them. Well, I took a trip to one of the trips, I guess, to up to the Northeast, to the Niagara Falls mm -hmm. with one of the guys that you probably met. Um, and I can't tell you his name where I might have to kill you, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway we went up to the Northeast uh, for, uh, uh, it may have been the, um, one of the gatherings or something. And he, he went with me and we went to Tom Sawyer's house and Tom invited us to go to Niagara Falls. Right. Uh, so we drove up with, or rode up with Tom, uh, with this, uh, the, the, the guy that came with me. And um, I think another person came with us and Tom was so gracious with the young man and just, you know, joked with him as Tom can do and made him feel so comfortable and um, happy. And I, I have videos of that trip that we did. I took a lot of videos, by the way, over the years of Tom at Virginia Beach, at um, Sedona and other other places in New York. And in fact, I, I videotaped, I sent, sent you a copy of that, Richard, of, the, of that last gathering we had at Carol's before he died. Yeah. Yep. Um, where he talked about, hey, look, don't expect me to start you know, channeling. Don't channel me. Nobody's going to yeah. be channeling Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going to happen. So yesterday I was listening or actually watching one of those videos. And it was in Sedona. And he clarified that for me in, it, you know, the idea that he said something at that point about, not channeling and all that stuff and he said and when you pass on you know you'll you'll be on the other side and you don't have you don't hang around you don't you know you go and you do what you do unless there's some spiritual need to do so or some connection that draws you to get together or that makes 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 it so that that's appropriate right so, you know i hadn't made that connection before because he was always adamant i'm not you know don't expect me to be, you know, let go. Just say bye and that's it. I'm going, I'm doing my thing. But on several occasions, I, I, I remember him talking about um, that there are coming, comings together, you know, uh, afterwards where that, that could occur 
but that would be a special circumstance. So I've, I've been thinking about that lately and thinking about Tom and thinking about where is he, you know, what's he doing? Where, you know, is, is he around? And, and others like Joe Stanton and my wife, you know, Isa. I mean, I've had experiences of uh, being saved, not, I'm saved, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, I've been saved already, thank you. Um, but I, I, and I'll share this just because it's connected with Isa. Um, and I guess we're running on time here. You guys have, have been very gracious to allow me to open up and share. I thought hey, I this interviewing have thing is easy. <laughs> I'm not going to have much to say. You know, I've got these a few experiences. I wrote them down here. You know, like a cheat list here. So uh, I was with this guy I was telling you about, which is why I'm bringing this up. Um, this young man, and he was very much into walkie talkies. And so I thought, oh, this is great, you know. So I got a set of walkie talkies and we would talk, you know, when I had to go out to the drugstore and he was in the car. Say, hey, Chris, are you there? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. So we had a lot of fun with that for a while. And then it, we, we, it waned. And I had the walkie talkies in the back seat of my car. And just, you know, just thought it'd be fun to leave them there in case we needed them. So I was driving with him near my house, actually, not maybe less than two miles from the house, in the car, driving along, had a walkie-talkie in the back, and there was a flag woman. Uh, you know, you have flag men, but this was a flag woman. Oh. And she was sitting there with her walkie-talkie. And I could tell she was probably talking on the walkie-talkie to her friend who was on the other end of the line, who was also a, another flag woman, as I discovered. So they were talking on their walkie-talkie, and I thought, I wonder what they're talking about. I bet it's not about the highway. So I reached back into the back of the car, got my walkie-talkie, turned it on channel 22, believe it or not. And so I was listening on the walkie-talkie, and by the time I started listening, she, she waved to go on. And of course, they were just talking. And so I heard her say, but I thought you said, no, I thought you said, and I got the impression, that, well, she said something. I thought she said to go, no, no, they've already gone. So they had gotten distracted with their walkie-talkies, and she flagged me on. And I was about, uh, at the, wow. there's a curve just ahead of me. And so I, I realized, wait a minute, they're talking about something very important here. So I pulled no. over. And a car came around that curve. We would have hit head on. Wow. And by virtue of you know, months and months earlier, having developed this whole walkie talkie thing, playing with the walkie talkie, having it in the back seat, had on channel 22, which has happened to be the channel they were talking on. The impulse to pick up the, I mean, I wasn't, an angel didn't come in and say, pick up the walkie talkie and listen to the thing. You know, <laughs> it was really more of a, of a you know, just a casual thing almost. Yeah. But that was, that was Isa. And because yeah. Isa died in a head on car crash in a curve. And so this was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, all this was set up. Probably who knows when it was set up for that to occur. And that's the way that that, that presence from the other side works it's like tom used to talk about wake up you know or aren't you pretty or telling the pilot sit up you know you're doing such a fine job when he was in the airplane that that almost right. crashed or did or yeah i guess he avoided the crash because he told the pilot you're you're doing a great job and so he sat up a little bit and saw what he needed to see so it's that kind of guidance that comes from the other side and I suspect Tom is still doing that kind of stuff, um, you know, on the other side and Isa and Joe Stanton and all of our other friends who have <laughs> gone on now. Um, so th that was just remarkable to me that, that that's that simplicity of the angelic kingdom or, of our friends and our guides from the other side. So there's that. I love it. Beautifully said. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. And it's, 
to me, the storytelling, right? That That is so powerful here. The thing of all the stories and all of the messages and all the meaning that is behind that is, is fantastic. You know, and, and it is interesting because, you know, one of the many things you touched on, you know, is, is your, you found a life of service. And I know that's characteristic of myself, Richard, and many on the path, you know, is, is we, we, we realize the opportunity, the need and the desire to really go out there and reach out. And originally, you know, we think it's going to be some certain way or whatever. And then we allow life to just sort of unfold. And here we are in the mainstream of life as me as a, mm -hmm. a, a volunteer ambulance, you know, a, a volunteer ambulance or whatever, you know, helping people, right? You know, and, and lo and behold, here we are. And of course, for those who don't know Richard, next to me as is uh, one of his parts of service is uh, being a clown. In fact, he was just clowning around tonight at the voting line. It took me an hour to get through the line. When I got done and called my comedy partner, and we came, ba came back up and performed for the people who were still in line. <laughs> yeah, and I could just imagine this is in your life of you, y'all have the experience to see is how or where you, you probably touched on at least one, if not more, people just doing what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, it reminds me, uh, Tom talked a lot about um, the simple ways of doing things. Uh, going to one of the conferences uh, years ago, Joe Stanton and I stopped, it was in 1996 or seven, when they had the crash of that uh, in Montoursville, that uh, French group, that was going going to go to France and the plane crashed. And Mont, uh, Montoursville is right next to where we go to our route to go to the conference. So we decided to take a, a little detour to go through Montoursville that year and to just go there and be with those people. We didn't, we didn't go tell them that we're from this great spiritual group that comes and does healing and all that. We went there and we just bought a t-shirt. You know, they were selling t-shirts to raise money for the families and whatnot. And so just the act of going there and participating with the community in a very simple way was like taking the energy of, of the priesthood with us and the healing of your presence. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. You just need to be with somebody. And I'm, I'm yes. sure you've experienced that. Um, just be there, you know. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Eckhart. I really enjoy listening to him because he really is, uh, he, he focuses on the now. In fact, that's his mm -hmm. book and just his whole emphasis is working towards the now and in the moment. I love that part of your message. I mean, so much of what you shared, but one of the things is, is, is how it ultimately became the simplicity of the spirituality and the growth. Yeah. It, it, you know, initially it's like, wow, what's afterwards? Is there UFOs? Is there so on and so forth? And psychic abilities and uh, all these other things until it sort of just settles in and it becomes just a part of, of life and around us. And, and just, I feel so grateful uh, for all of the people in my life, along with my own openness to it, to have been open to it, because it's how you see things now becomes different, you know, mm -hmm. just, and, and that's what sort of makes it different, you know, for those on the, on the spiritual path, so to speak, is, is you do, you start to think different. And you had mentioned that early on because of the rheumatic fever, you know, and the experience there, you really, you know, you started to recognize you were thinking differently. And uh, I, I, my quick story here, and Richard, maybe you have one here, uh, you know, it relates to that is, is that, you know, there I was, you know, 16 years old, hanging out with the boys, you know, and we all went up to the water tower. We had snuck some, you know, beer and alcohol and things up there. And, you know, drinking and all the guys are sitting there and talking about the cars, girls and whatever, you know, and uh, I'm pretty quiet, it's very, you know, I'm like you introverted. And I was just staring out the space. And so somebody turned around to me and said, Mike, what, what are you thinking about? I said, what's one inch after infinity? 
That shut it down in a hurry. It did. It really did. But that because they, they, it was so funny because they thought I was joking that it became that this big humor thing that, you know, and it wasn't. It actually, it became sort of my survival mechanism just because I realized I'd say something, but to everybody else, it would be perceived as a joke and I'd sort of laugh. But it really was. I was way out there, you know, just. You don't trying. answer this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Richard, how about you? Boy, oh, uh, you know, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't hang around with I never was never a drinker and didn't hang around with groups uh, but for some reason the, the story that's coming to my mind that's on my mind tonight is that when we went to vote today uh, we, the line came in this way and then in the building and we approached from this side and it just occurred to me at that moment to, to announce loudly to everyone that the line on my side was much shorter <laughs> I could, that I could just walk right in. And then I just kept stopping and <clears throat> asking people, is this the end of the line? Oh, just behind you? Oh, just behind? Oh, just... And I was joking with people all the way to the back of the line where there was an old couple being guided by their daughter. And I've come to find out the, this couple were 97 and 91 years old. It was way in the back of the line. It would have taken them an hour to get up front. And it occurred to me, it must be okay for them to just go up front. And, and as I was about to ask something like that, the poll worker showed up and said, you don't have to wait back here. You can go to the front. And the, the daughter was going nuts trying to get both of, the, go both of her parents to pay attention. So I took the old guy's arm, took his hand in my arm and walked him up. He was sharp as a tack. A little slow, but it took a, a while. But he, he was asking, is Wendell Wilkie on the ticket for today? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he could, maybe he could uh, vote for Dewey again, hoping he'd be beat Truman this time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Got him all the way up to the front of the line uh, and turned him loose and went back and joked with people all the way back again. It, it just happened to be in this right spot at the right time to be of that service to the guy. And, and I had a ball with it. It was, that made more, that, that meant more to me than the uh, juggling and whatnot we, we did afterward. That, that moment of connection there and assistance. Yeah, you and I share the Santa Claus um, process, oh, which, which yeah. we've grown into, <laughs> literally. Yep. Yep. Um, never thought thinking that you would be Santa Claus one day, right? Um, but there's, no. in, in virtue of, uh, you know, the way that I do what I do, I get to interact with people, and you interact in, in a, a, a way as well, using that role to transform it. Because everybody yep. thinks that Christmas is about getting stuff. And so my role is to turn it around and saying, it's, no, it's not about getting stuff. Uh, it's about sharing your love with other people. And to, that's, that's, you know, why do I, I sing the song, better watch out, better not cry, better not pout, I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming. To... So we sing this. And then at the end of the song, I say, well, why is it that I'm coming to town? Anybody know? <laughs> uh, to bring gifts, uh, to bring candy, uh, to because uh, you know I mean that's the answer that everybody says. Well, I do those yeah. things, but that's not why I come to town. I come to town because I love you, and you you bring me to town because we share that love, and so I wouldn't be coming if you didn't invite me, right? So we we're. We're here to share love, and that's the message. And so I, I'm, you know, through the stories that I've written and through the experiences, it's the families have now for 25 years, that's how long I've been doing, are still coming year after year to the, to the programs that I do in Roanoke. There are about 5,000 people that come each year uh, wow. for the stories. And they keep coming and they keep coming and they grow up and they keep coming and bring their children and the, the teenagers still come in because it's not about, 
you know, the getting what you're going to get for Christmas. You don't have to believe in Santa Claus. You know, I tell the kids, well, you know, at some point people stop believing in me, but I don't stop believing in you. And so that's what's important to me is that I believe in you and that you can believe in yourself and believe in each other. And so that takes that whole belief, believing in Santa Claus away from the teenagers. So they don't have to worry about that anymore. Right. And they're really drawn to that message. So I know that you do that, Richard, because, you know, even though you're probably in a, more of a, like a mall setting. Yeah. I did that for one year and I just I couldn't do it there because I wanted to do more. But right. uh, I tried to do what you're doing. And that's hard. That's kind of like the equivalent of me working, you know, in the work that I do and trying to maintain my, <laughs> my sanity, you know. Uh, that I just make crazy. I just make a prayer. Send me yeah. those who who you may need me. Yeah, and I really mm-hmm. respect the Santa Mall Santas that that yeah. know that. Not all of them do. Right, right. Um, the the ones that do. That's a, that's a great service that you're doing there uh, to Thank bring you. that into that setting. Um, so. Wow, well, that's with a lot of wet diapers, but also do a lot of beauty. <laughs> So, Tom, we are at the hour, and I very, very, very much appreciate your time, your stories, your sharing. I mean, that's really what this is about. It's an attempt to really resurrect this communication, the stories and things for whoever may be out there, but certainly for ourselves and myself. I know it's just a joy to be able to recall these times and to hear and recollection. And so, uh, I, again, I thank you so much for your time. And you'll have to come join us uh, if, if your neighbor, Jeff, decides to, to jump on. And, and maybe we could roast him. What do you think? Oh, that's oh yeah. <laughs> that's I have in, in the videos that I have, you and um, Richard and Jeff and all of us in all of these earlier versions of ourselves, it's, it's a hoot. It's really... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> See those. We'll have to sh- share the videos at some point or another. Yeah, dig them out. Dig them out. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. Oh, that's fantastic. And then we can share the stories that we can't talk about online here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's what I was asked. Did we have our clothes on? <laughs> I was going to talk about that. I had that on the list. <laughs> oh, <what's it? laughs> oh, yeah. It's on the list. <laughs> checking it twice <laughs> yes oh that's fantastic well we'll look forward to having you back on Tom so much appreciated thank you very much Richard thanks again for all your help and we'll just chance to say goodbye God bless and really to the belief that, that you heard Tom talk about just have that belief and be open minded Absolutely.